So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome after two weeks uh, on the penultimate uh, meeting of the series uh, State Diversity and Security Studies on Interdependencies in Contemporary World. Well, united in diversity. This is surely the core of the post-war, after-war political and cultural uh, identity of Europe. And at the same time, uh, it is a part of an extraordinary uh, political project called European Union. However, it is not easy to grasp the you know, real empirical meaning of European identity. And it is also worth asking, do we speak about European identity in general or the, let's say, European Union citizen identity? And it is always easier to uh, to say than to truly awake and stimulate uh, the European mindset among uh, European people. About these problems and many other problems, we will talk uh, today with our outstanding guest, Professor Orian Caligaro uh, from the European School of Political, Political and Social Sciences of the Université Catholique de Lille in France. Professor Caligaro also holds the position of a visiting professor at the College of Europe in Belgium and associate researcher uh, at the Université Libre de Bruxelles in, um, uh, also in Belgium. So, Oriana, we cordially welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Obash, for the, the kind invitation uh, in this uh, uh, lecture series. Um, so, just a general uh, introduction uh, before I will share uh, some slides with you. I hope this will uh, this will this will help you to to follow my talk. Um, but the, I'm, I'm um, let's say I've been working for uh, many years now on European identity, but not so much uh, with the idea of defining European identity because I think it's a very risky and uh, complicated task. So it is not uh, what I'm, I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is to understand how the European Union and its institutions have tried to define this European identity and also how, they, how they've used this concept of Europe, European identity. Because what is, I think is uh, crucial here is um, why European identity is politically useful for the European Union. And you can imagine why. Uh, to have a common identity, to promote a common identity for a political uh, project is very important um, for its legitimacy. So from the very start, um, when this project of, of, uh, of European communities uh, emerged, there was always in the background this idea that there is already something like a European identity, a European culture, and the European project, the political economic project, comes on top of this, so that this identity foundation is already there. But uh, it's something to, to say this, but then to substantiate this. If there is a European identity, a European common culture, what is it exactly? Because Europe, as you know, is a is a very broad concept geographically, politically, historically. So what do we really mean when we talk about European identity? And in this case, what do the European institutions mean when they talk about European identity? So I will now uh, share my, my, my slides uh, so that you, you, you can follow um, um, easier uh, this this talk. Um, what I can already tell you is that I don't look at this from um, the very start of the European integration project. Uh, as you will see, my my presentation starts in the late 70s. Uh, and the reason uh, for this is that, um, sorry, I'm trying to open the slides, I, I think it's opening now. Um, the, the reason for this, yes, sorry, I wait for it to open so that we follow together. 
here it is. I think normally you see it now. Um, yes, I start from the 1970s because, as you know, uh, the European integration started essentially as an economic project. And in the Treaty of Rome, the first, uh, the first uh, treaty, there was not um, um, a, a specific uh, uh, mentioning of culture, um, of, of a European identity, of a European culture. This was completely uh, out of the competences of these emerging uh, European uh, communities. And it's actually uh, in the 70s that uh, the EU and the European institutions started talking about culture, European culture. So that's why I look uh, from, from the 70s. And what I want to show you is that over uh, the long, this long period, um, when the institutions try to define this European identity, they oscillate between uh, different main dimensions. And what I could identify as these main dimensions, it's heritage, the reference to a European heritage, reference to a European culture, and more recently, uh, a, a greater focus on values. And you will see that the balance is kind of changing over time between these uh, different aspects. Um, so what are... Uh, my main uh, my main questions uh, here um, is whether um, this European identity, as understood by the European institution, is mostly based on culture, on history, or based on uh, those broader uh, and potentially universal values. Uh, because you see here what is at stake. Um, if, you, if you base your community on a shared history and a clearly defined shared culture, then it's obviously more difficult to welcome, uh, to extend this community. Um, because there is this reference to the past, to a thick cultural identity. When you base uh, your, your common identity on more abstract, more uh, uh, larger entities like values, then it's pot potentially more inclusive for newcomers. And of course, this is a, a central uh, question for, for the European Union. Who can be European? Um, so this is why... Um, Throughout my, my, my presentation, I will always try to understand this respective role uh, of culture, history on the one side, and more political elements, values, citizenship on, on the other side. And what do I look at? So I told you I work on uh, the approaches of the European institutions. So it is the European Commission, the European Parliament, of course, the Council of the EU, so the, the 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 the, repre the the representatives of the of the of the member states, and also some uh, high representatives. So, for instance, you know, I look at the discourses because here, of course, discourse the words are very important. So, discourses of uh, president of the European Commission, for instance, or of members of the European Parliament. Um, so, this this my my the research I did on on this was mostly based on on EU official documents and, and discourses, and sometimes also uh, policies, programs uh, developed by the European Union. So here I will present, uh, the just give you a, an overview of the four big periods that I identify. Of course, this is an oversimplification, but I, can, I, can, I could still see that there were some uh, Main, a uh, main a dominant approach that we could identify in these different periods. Um, the first period is um, precisely when this um, first cultural initiatives emerge in the 70s, as I told you. Um, so it's the late 70s, early 80s. In this period, um, European institutions, especially the European Parliament, started to talk about a common uh, European cultural heritage 
as uh, a way of illustrating European identity and values. And we will see that this was uh, a rather elitist approach to culture and actually a rather limited understanding of European culture. What happened later in the mid uh, 80s and even more in the 90s is a, a widening of this understanding of European heritage with uh, more and more attention given to diversity. As you know, diversity is now in the motto of the European Union, united in diversity. Uh, but then I will ask the question, what diversity exactly? The diversity of what? Um, but Drodzy Państwo, najwyraźniej mamy jakieś problemy techniczne po stronie naszej gościni, ale zaraz postaramy się je rozwiązać, więc proszę o chwilę, o chwilę cierpliwości.
that uh, we lost connection with our with our speaker uh, with our lecture. Uh, however, as the saying says, uh, there always has to be the first time. So so yeah, <laughs> yeah. just a little problem. No worries, Orian. Okay. The time is yours. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay, I I will share again my. Uh, slides with you and I will try to remember where we got disconnected. Um, I was describing those uh, four main periods that I identify um, and I think I was in this second one when there was the introduction of this uh, diversity concept uh, which enlarge also the conception of European identity and uh, the, European co um, the European community of, of uh, values. And then I come, um, I hope you see my slides now, I hope, yes. Uh, I come to the, the third uh, period um, where you have, uh, it's the 2000s, so it's the main event for the European uh, integration of this period is the, the enlargement, the big enlargement, and the series actually of enlargements, um, and which means also a greater diversity for Europe, for the European Union. And um, to, to manage this diversity, there is the introduction of a new concept, which is uh, the intercultural dialogue. And this intercultural dialogue, as you will see, is precisely meant uh, to make possible um, this the, the conception and the achievement of this value-based uh, European citizenship. Um, of course, this is a, a, an objective, an ideal, such a, a value-based European uh, citizenship. But you have uh, important obstacles, uh, and we see them in the 2000, uh, 2010s. So this is the last period, the fourth period. Um, uh, there were many important uh, crises in this period, the Eurozone crisis, uh, the mig migration crisis. And uh, against this background, there is also um, the rise of, uh, here again, it's to make it short, we call them, let's say, uh, populist, nationalist uh, uh, forces in, in, uh, in uh, EU member states. And what is interesting is that these uh, political groups and sometimes governments, when, when those uh, parties uh, come at, at power, um, they, they actually attack the EU uh, on the ground of values uh, and identity. And, and, and this is a main challenge for, for, for the EU in this attempt of self-definition -def through the defense of fundamental values. So these are the four uh, periods that we are going uh, through together now. So let me start with this first period. Um, in the, in the mid-70s, uh, the EU was facing already, the, as you know, the story of the European Union is a, is a, is a story of, of crisis. Um, um, and... Uh, of course, in the mid in the mid seventies, early seventies, you had an economic crisis, which was uh, a main challenge for the European Union because the European Union so far uh, received its legitimacy mostly from its uh, economic achievements. And with the oil shock and 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 the the, the economic crisis, the these economic achievements were not so much there anymore. The other big uh, of the period, you, here we have to go back a bit more in time. It's also a, a values crisis, an identity crisis with the 68 movement, the student movement, um, which also asks um, um, questions about what is, uh, is growth, economic growth so central. We also need to take care about all the dimension of life and culture being one of uh, those dimensions. And this also had an impact on, 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 the, on the EU self-definition. And I could observe this in, the, in debates of the European Parliament. And in the early 70s, um, some parliamentarians uh, in, the, in the European Parliament proposed 
to take initiatives, so European initiatives in favor of heritage, cultural heritage, and in particular, architectural heritage. And why did they do so? Because they precisely identify heritage as a way of bringing Europeans together and also as a way of um, giving substance, of representing, of, illustr of illustrating uh, European identity. Um, so it's really, you can read it like this in the debates. If we promote a common uh, architectural heritage, um, the Europeans will understand better what Europe is about, what we have in common. Um, so what was this heritage? So if you look at the very first uh, funds that were dedicated to heritage at the E level, it's mostly um, Christian heritage and also uh, you know, the Greek and, and Roman uh, um, past. Uh, an important uh, step here is the accession of Greece. Greece joined um, the EU in 81. And as, as you know, Greece has a, has a huge uh, uh, architectural historical heritage. And at the time, this, this heritage was in a bad shape. The, the Acropolis, for instance, and the Parthenon were, were uh, very at, at risk. So um, again, the Parliament, the European Parliament said we absolutely need to have uh, to be uh, to show solidarity with the Greeks to help them um, renovate uh, those sites. But why do we do so? Because if you take the Acropolis, for instance, this is the birthplace of democracy and, and European community is about democracy. So to to save this, to save and to promote this heritage. It's also to, to promote our European values. Um, and here you see that heritage is also a way to define a common identity. So it's really not by chance that the first sites which benefited from um, a common uh, European uh, uh, fund are Christian sites, so mostly churches, uh, monasteries, or Greek and Roman sites. Uh, it tells us that in this approach, so here by the European Parliament and also with the support of the European Commission, um, European identity is uh, defined through Christianity and a reference to, to the Roman and Greek uh, antiquity. And uh, I think this is very well um, um, illustrated by a quote of, um, of uh, Theodor Heuss. He was each of these this heritage at the Acropolis is cultural heritage, the capital uh, Roman legal system, Capitol Hill in Rome, and Golgotha, hill on which uh, uh, Jesus Christ was, was crucified. So of course, the Christian heritage. So you see that it's not only about sites, about buildings, it's about talking, it's really talking about common a common identity and common values. But as you see, um, it's quite limited. Um, it's reference to a very uh, a, 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 um, remote past uh, and a specific religious heritage, but uh, maybe there are many other dimensions of European identity. And actually, this discourse has been criticized very quickly um, f from within also the European institutions already in, 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 the, in the 80s. Um, so here you had um, uh, members of the parliament who said, well, um, churches, uh, Greek temples, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but Europe is also about local uh, traditions, about regional uh, cultures, um, and also there was, for instance, a proposal by the socialist group in the European Parliament uh, to include in this uh, heritage, in this conception of heritage, uh, industrial sites. Because uh, 
Industrialization has also been a main uh, moment of the European history and shaped European uh, identity. And for them, it was also, uh, and it, of course, the 80s was a period of deindustrialization. So you, you had, you know, uh, coal mines uh, closing. Um, and to, to celebrate these sites, to, for instance, to transform them in museums was a way to also celebrate this dimension, the workers' history for, for and so this social heritage as part of the European heritage. There was an extension of, of the, this understanding of, of, of European uh, heritage. Um, again, because um, it's, it's very politically very important because uh, the people in the parliament, in the European parliament, they were using heritage to define a common European identity. And it's also in this period that um, the, this rhetoric of unity and diversity emerged. Um, and diversity became uh, a, a core value, actually. It, it also, you, you have the word diversity in the, in the European treaties. For, inst for instance, the respect of, of the national uh, 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 cultural diversity. And um, so here, what is diversity uh, exactly? Is it the diversity of uh, national cultures, but not only, it's also the diversity at the regional, local level. And we can see a further uh, diversity introduced in the 90s. It's on the type of heritage and the type of past that you, that you remember. Because as you see so far, it was uh, clearly a positive uh, heritage. Um, the Roman, uh, 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 civilization, the Greek civilization, Christianity, all this was remembered in a positive way. Um, you can find, of course, dark dimensions in these uh, civilizations, but here it was obviously to celebrate uh, uh, the great uh, foundations of the European uh, civilization and the European identity. Um, but in the 90s, there was a memorial boom uh, as you probably know, with the, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the USSR, um, the European identity was completely uh, re, re, reshaped. And it was uh, uh, the start of a, of a deep work on the traumatic European past. So what happened uh, uh, before the European uh, integration in the 50s and most uh, mainly the, the, the Second World War. Uh, but also the war before this and the author themes um, before and after uh, the war. And so you have, uh, again, you have initiatives of the European Parliament, of the European Commission with programs to promote the memory of, the, of this negative, negative uh, European past, fascism, uh, Nazism, Stalinism, uh, to say, well, this is also our European identity. Uh, it's not only those glorious uh, uh, cultural heritage, it's also, it's also this heritage of war, uh, genocides, um, etc. So, but here again, um, to remember this, if you look at the, the EU text and, and programs, why do we need to remember this as Europeans? It's because what we are today is the exact opposite of this. The EU exists today to avoid these types, these types of regimes to emerge again. So it's to promote democracy, rule of law, and the protection of human rights. So um, again, the type of uh, cultural initiatives that you will take uh, also say something about your the values, the political values that you defend. And this is clearly visible in the, the EU, uh, uh, in this case, cultural citizenship policies. Um, and now I move uh, to my um, third um, period. Um, so here you have two uh, main elements uh, to understand this new evolution with uh, this introduction of the intercultural dialogue concept. Um, you have um, the, the increasing diversity of European societies, 
uh, of course, migration has been a massive uh, um, uh, phenomenon in whole Europe for centuries. But it, it, you see that in the 80s and even more in the 90s, it became increasingly um, on the top of the agenda uh, in, uh, in, the, in the different EU member states, uh, mostly in the Western European countries, which, which uh, uh, have uh, the greatest uh, amount of uh, uh, migrants, with this idea of integration. Um, and, um, and here you know that there is a very deep uh, cleavage of whether uh, migrants should be integrated and how they should integrate in the host uh, societies. Uh, do, can we uh, tolerate uh, uh, radically different cultures? Uh, should they assimilate? Um, and for certain political parties, um, this was uh, um, formulated in terms of us be, uh, against them, right? So there was, uh, you know, this, 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 um, um, this focus on identity uh, very much increased in the political debates in the 90s. Um, and it's true that initially it was mostly national debates um, between, between national parties uh, in the member states. But um, you, this idea of intercultural dialogue was uh, coined um, by mostly by international organization, the United Nations, the Council of Europe. And initially it was to help um, to manage communication, to, to manage uh, a better uh, coexistence and communication, uh, especially after um, uh, conflicts, for instance, in uh, the post-war ex-Yugoslavia. Um, so this term uh, then gained into, um, uh, it gained attention with 9-11, um, because 9-11, as you know, there was uh, this uh, Huntington talking about uh, uh, the clash of civilization. Um, so to, av to avoid a, a, conf a cultural conflict, we need to use this intercultural dialogue. So to make a, a, a discussion, a peaceful discussion between cultures possible. And the first time that you see this uh, concept used by the European Union, it's um, in its partnership with uh, the Mediterranean um, countries, the Euromed uh, pro program. And here it's interesting because um, it's uh, because Euromed has uh, mostly economic uh, dimension, but there were also cultural uh, cultural uh, programs. And this idea is that okay, we have different civilization, the European one and the mostly Arab Muslim uh, civilization on the other side of the Mediterranean. Um, but we can establish an intercultural uh, dialogue. So we see that here it's an intercultural dialogue, but between distinct civilization when it was first used by uh, the European uh, Union. And the term was uh, eventually adopted for within the European Union in the 2000s, precisely to face the greater diversity introduced with uh, the enlargement. Um, enlargement made Europe even more diverse and also to also recognize, but here at the EU level, the impact of uh, international immigration on the European societies as a whole. Um, because here, so far again, the, the EU was more trying to cope with, you know, the diversity uh, between the national cultures. But um, when we talk about a European identity, we need to also to talk to European citizens with an African background, with uh, a Muslim heritage, with an Asian uh, uh, background, etc. cetera. Um, so what will be our conception of European citizenship? Uh, shall we stay on a strict uh, reference to um, Christianity, uh, the Greco-Roman uh, antiquity, or shall we have, um, uh, again, a more flexible understanding? And this is where um, this 
already dialogue was introduced in the EU to say, okay, we have many different cultures within the EU, and it's and we need to to make the the dialogue possible. And here. They make between citizenship, cultural diversity, and intercultural dialogue. So uh, this European citizenship is possible and is open to diversity, um, but precisely because it's not based on a clearly defined past culture, but it's also it's based on values. Which values? So um, today, the EU has in this treaty, in Article 2, you have a list of values. Um, the rule of law, the protection of human rights, uh, pluralism, uh, non-discrimination, equality, all these values, you can find them in the, in the, um, in the European treaties. Um, so, is it now the question, and here, of course, this is an objective to have a European citizenship based on this value. Um, the citizenship that you have, your passport, uh, it stays a, a, a national one. And you are a, a European citizen because you have the citizenship of one of the EU member states. So. The European citizenship is still um, an emerging concept. Um, and this is the big question for the EU to give content. So one attempt is to give content through values, by defend, defending common values. And here I move um, to my to the, the, the last and final period period. Um, is when the EU faced this series of crises. And that actually the EU was attacked um, by, we can call them the Eurosceptics, um, on the very ground of values. And I call this uh, the EU values uh, dilemma. So what, what happened, and here this period starts, uh, let's say in 2010s, this is uh, this, this period, you see the emergence of what uh, um, Cécile Lecomte and uh, Roma, Romana, Romana Coman called a value-based Euroscepticism. Um, so uh, they, they analyzed this in Hungary, Poland, and uh, Romania also, where you have uh, governments in, in these EU uh, member states that contest the EU values because of their own values. So they considered that the way, and as you, as you know, I don't um, specify this, but you are aware of this, these countries are on in a, in a legal conflict with the EU uh, uh, because the EU considered that they breach certain of these EU values, uh, the, 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 the first one being the, the respect of the rule of law. And, but the conflict of values is, is much broader than just the, 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 the rule of law. Um, it's the idea that uh, I, I, I will take mostly the, the example of uh, Viktor uh, Orban, the, the, the leader uh, of Hungary, because he's probably the most vocal. You know, he's, he presents his, himself as a proud, uh, illiberal uh, leader. And the uses he makes of values, it says, for, I will take the example of uh, the, the non-discrimination of uh, LGBTI uh, uh, individuals, which is indeed uh, now guaranteed by the EU legal system because you cannot uh, discriminate a person based on its uh, sexual orientation, for instance. So this is here, the value is the fundamental rights of, of individual. Uh, but uh, Orban is, uh, so this is one of his ma major argument that the EU would make the promotion of uh, homosexuality, for instance. And he would say that this goes against fundamental values of the Hungarian society. So the respect of a certain idea of the traditional family or certain Christian values. But it does not say only for the Hungarian society, it says that it's actually 
uh, a wrong interpretation of what should be a European identity. Uh, for him, a European identity should be the respect of certain Christian values. And in his approach, um, this, uh, this should uh, not include the, the protection of uh, LGBTI plus uh, people. So here you have a, a, a clear conflict of values, uh, but with, which also um, has at stake the, the definition of what should be the, the common European identity. And this conflict of, uh, of values had many different um, um, uh, consequences. And uh, so one, I can give you one uh, event. Uh, in 2014, there was a, a new commission uh, formed and um, the, the commissioner, the nominated commissioner for education, culture and citizenship was uh, Hungarian. Uh, Tibor uh, uh, Navracic, and this uh, 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 political figure uh, is a member of Fidesz, the, the party of, of uh, Viktor Orban. He had been member of uh, Orban uh, governments in the past. And when he was nominated, there was a reaction of uh, civil societies organizations working in this field of culture, education, citizenship, because they say it's a very bad signal to have uh, such a uh, 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 politician defending such ideas in this function. Um, so you had uh, um, letters sent, again, organization of uh, artists, of uh, uh, cultural um, um, actors to the European Commission. In the end, and also protests from within the European Parliament. Mr. Navraci uh, kept his uh, position. But what were their arguments is that, uh, no, when, when you defend this person, uh, his political positions are against fundamental uh, European uh, values. Uh, and even more here, it's, it's, a, it's a more specific uh, um, um, uh, incident. But of course, one major uh, moment of clashes around values and European identity, it's the what has been called the migrant crisis, um, which uh, started in summer 2015. Um, here again, I will take the, um, the example of, uh, of Mr. Orban. Um, um, when uh, he was very, uh, he criticized uh, the the EU um, migration uh, policies in this period, considering that too many migrants were entering uh, the EU uh, territory. And in uh, September 2015, just before an official visit of Orban to, to Brussels, to the European Commission, um, and to the, to the European institutions in general, um, he made, uh, he gave an interview to a German newspaper where uh, he said that um, we, why can we not uh, accept all those migrants? It's because they are not Christians. They are radically uh, from a different culture. So they can, they cannot, European identity is rooted in, in Christianity. So they cannot be uh, integrated in, in, uh, the, in Europe. And what is interesting is that um, uh, Donald Tusk, who was then president of the European Commission, when uh, be, just before Orban was officially received in Brussels, um, he reacted in a press conference saying that um, referring to Christianity in a public de debate on migration, so here it's the quota, must mean in the first place the readiness to show solidarity and sacrifice. For Christian, it shouldn't matter what race, religion, or, and nationality the person in need represents. So it was a, re, a direct re response to Orban. Um, and actually, it resonates uh, even more today, this quote of, of, of Tusk, um, because we see that here, again, we talk about Christian values and Christian identity, and you have uh, two very different um, interpretation of those values. Um, Tusk basically saying that 
well, if you refer to uh, common Christian values, then we should uh, welcome uh, those uh, refugees in need. And I think, yeah, the quote is is all the more all the most striking today because, as you know, with the the the, the war in uh, Ukraine and the, the massive uh, arrival of Ukrainian refugees um, in uh, in EU member states, there was this debate. Uh, it reopened to some extent the debate that started with the migrant crisis in 2015, with a, a, a double standard, with the EU taking very different. Uh, measures to welcome the the, the Ukrainian um, refugees uh, in comparison with those who so mostly Syrian, Afghan um, of of uh, of the previous the previous years. So, and as you know, so I, I will not open this debate. But precisely when looking at this double standard, people were wondering, but what 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 is the what are the standards here? On which criteria? Uh, because Ukrainian are European, yes, but they are not members of the EU. So what, what, where does Europe stop? And if it's about fundamental values, precisely, should we to open uh, to show this uh, uh, hospitality and solidarity? Should we sh look at nationality, or is it uh, uh, a universal values that should apply to any human being? So I think that so you see the debate was already there. Um, in 2015, and it's it um, it's it's still there um, today. Um, so this example of Tusk to 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 show you how Christianity could be could be used in in very different ways. Now I, I continue on this um, um, on, on, on antagonism uh, around values. Um, I moved to the the elections of the European Parliament in 2019. Um, here again, um, so what I, I call those populist nationalist forces in Europe, um, and Orban again being one of the, the most vocal representative, for this uh, election, they made a, a campaign very much focused on identity, um, on this, uh, again, the defense of those traditional European values against this liberal uh, uh, EU um, and again very much focused on on migration and how migration could uh, jeopardize European identity. So this was very and also actually um, this question of migration was very central also during the the Brexit uh, discussion and so again it was everywhere in the political debate. So in the end, uh, in 2019, um, the, the, the populist uh, nationalist group in the European Parliament did not make a very good score. But why do I, I speak about this, this background is because, um, so it is the time when the, the commission of Ursula von der Leyen was, uh, was, um, uh, um, was set up. And um, when there is a new commission, sometimes the commissioners get a new title with the, so the commissions are sometimes organized differently from the previous one, like in a government. You have ministers with a, a new portfolios. And in the uh, von der Leyen commission, you had a very important portfolio, strategic portfolio, uh, including equality, culture, education, but also migration, asylum policy, um, and um, the, the security of EU borders. So you see it covers very different aspects. And this portfolio was called the pro protecting our European way of life. Um, and this uh, triggered a, a lot of reactions. What is our European way of life. Um, and what uh, many actors uh, saw in this, so like NGOs, like Amnesty International, or uh, also members of the European Parliament, um, they saw actually a, a, a very problematic appropriation of this populist rhetoric. And why do they see this? Because in this portfolio, you had Culture, so 
equality culture, so something, yes, defining what European identity is or could be, and also the protection of EU borders and migration. Uh, so it gives, since it's about protecting our European way of life, it gives the impression uh, that uh, it's protecting European culture um, against uh, uh, migration or other threats. Um, and this, this has been uh, criticized. Um, and uh, some MEPs, uh, 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 member of the parliament, the European parliament said, well, uh, the real threat uh, for Europe today, it's, uh, it's uh, populist and uh, uh, nationalist Eurosceptics, uh, uh, but, cert uh, but not the, the, the cultural diversity of Europe. Um, and so there was this critique that with this, this, uh, this portfolio and with this title, there was, uh, yes, a bit uh, a way of accommodating uh, the, the populist uh, uh, rhetoric. And um, the commissioner in question was, and it's still today, the, the Greek uh, um, Margaritis Kinas. Uh, now when the commissioner is nominated, he has a hearing uh, because the parliament, the European parliament needs to, um, to validate the, the nomination. So the commissioner needs to present its, uh, um, its project to the, to, the, to the European parliament. And, and the parliamentarians keep on asking, but okay, the European way of life, it's our common values, but why should we protect it against whom? And the commissioner was, we talked about terrorism, about, but he was put in a, a bit in difficulty. Um, and uh, in the end, um, the commission changed the name from protecting our European way of life to promoting our European way of life, which, you know, now you, you have less this idea of, a, of an external threat. Uh, but still, again, a lot of commentators and uh, European uh, actors in the parliament, in the civil society said, yes, but again, what do they mean by this European way of life? And for them, it still sounds that like the promotion of a, of a light culture, as we say in German, so as a, a, a dominant culture uh, to which the, the other cultural minorities should... Uh, um, uh, in which they should completely assimilate uh, to be European. And, 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 and for those uh, uh, critiques uh, within the, the parliament or... The ...which is the protection of cultures. This is... Um, this is what I what I uh, described as this um, um, this value uh, dilemma for for the European uh, Union. Uh, on the one hand, um, the European Union needs to be active uh, on the ground of values and identity uh, because. It needs also to re to respond to these attacks from uh, uh, Eurosceptics, uh, but at the same time, the EU is not in a position um, uh, of promoting um, a dominant European culture. Um, so it is in this in this very uh, very uh, tricky uh, position when uh, when there is this debate around around. Uh, which values should be uh, um, defended, but which values for which common identity. So I will, I will now uh, uh, conclude uh, with a few remarks. Obviously, uh, it's, uh, uh, the debate is, is uh, as you see, very, very open. But um, yeah, the main major uh, conclusion that I can draw is that obviously the European institutions um, do not have the legitimacy to uh, establish definitely was what is a common European identity and what is a, a, a common uh, ethos and community of values. Uh, it can give some elements. Uh, 
uh, traditions, the, the remote uh, uh, Greek Roman heritage. So it, it goes in many directions, but it cannot give a, a limited uh, a definition because precisely those boundaries are, are moving. Um, and and uh, they will remain in a, in a constant uh, debate. What is, uh, if again we look over the long time, what we can see is that um, there was an attempt um, at the beginning in the 70s, 80s to promote this uh, glorious uh, um, um, European past. As But again, because it was too limited uh, to a certain dominant culture and too exclusive of other cultures, this moved, it was enlarged uh, to make place, to, uh, to give place to this concept of diversity. Uh, and again, it evolved in the 2000s with a greater focus on values. So less focus on a cultural based identity with this discursive shift towards a more value-based, human rights-oriented uh, uh, citizenship. Uh, but, but again, um, there is no, this is not a final solution. First, because this value-based citizenship is only an objective. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's not realized yet. And, and, because precisely the values uh, at the foundation of this citizenship are, are still uh, debated. And this is what I wanted to my, my, my last uh, examples, um, that the EU needs to answer to those uh, uh, value-driven uh, um, Eurosceptic Euros uh, um, uh, political forces and for instance, the European way of life, in my opinion, was a very uh, clumsy and counterproductive attempt at responding uh, at, uh, at, in this discussion on, uh, on identity. And I talk about the minefield of identity because uh, it's indeed full of, of traps. Um, so I will, I will stop here. Uh, maybe my final uh, the final remarks is, of course, we, we experience other crises more recently, the COVID crisis and now the, the war in, uh, in, uh, in Ukraine. And in, in the case of the COVID, for instance, here it seems. But by acting, by finding um, a solutions to, to common challenges. And here, actually, a, a main value was at stake here. It's the one of solidarity, uh, you know, with this uh, uh, very big step, which was the neutralization of, of debt uh, to face uh, the COVID crisis. So it's maybe in this very concrete crisis and these very concrete solutions that uh, a, a common European identity is more efficiently progressing than when um, main culture of or main heritage, because again, it's potentially uh, exclusive. I will stop here. I, I hope I was not uh, too long and I very much look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Oriane, for this uh, inspirational uh, lecture. Uh, well, even technical problems cannot stop us from, from discussion. Uh, so, guys, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write them down uh, in the chat box. Uh, to be honest, I have many questions to our, to our guest, so uh, please let me, let me start. Orian, very simple question. Do you feel European? OK, I answer right away. Um, yes, I do. I do. Um, and but I guess. Uh, yes, exactly. You can feel European in many different ways.
we still have some problems with connection, Oriana. Stand. Um, I was educated as a European. Can you hear? No. No. Uh, well, okay. now yes. Uh, actually, uh, the connection is is uh, uh, breaking down, and we had some problems with with hearing you, with seeing you. But now it's okay. Let, maybe let me try to change the connection one second, maybe, or is it still is it good enough for me to talk? No, it's not so good. Huh? Um, I can it's, try to. It's not that good. So so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, try just try just one 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 more minute for. Uh, for changing uh, the quality of connection. Okay, the good the the connection that first failed is now reestablished, so it's it's a better one normally. Mm -hmm. okay. um, yes, yeah, so I was talking about the the role of education when I was a um, uh, a child in France in the eighties and the nineties. The European uh, project was uh, was a very big thing. There was a very pro-European atmosphere in France, and uh, as you know, France was uh, very. Uh, uh, since the start, very committed to the European uh, project. And I have to say that I was exposed to, uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to use an ugly word, but a very efficient uh, uh, European propaganda. But here I'm talking about the EU. I'm not talking the, I'm not talking about European and more culturally, but, um, and actually I'm saying this, that if I, if I am a scholar of the European Union today, it's also because that in the the universities in the school and then in university, they were those uh, academic programs uh, about how great it was to study in Europe, but also about this amazing European um, European project. And so I always had um, um, this this very now as a scholar, I can be much more critical about the European project. But it's true that I was raised in a, a political atmosphere that was very European. Uh, but then I had the chance to move in many different uh, European countries, and this is what made me a European: is that uh, I was, as I'm among those very few privileged uh, who studied in France, in Germany, in Italy, who had the possibility to 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 learn different European languages. Uh, and my life is completely European um, in in all aspects, but. What I'm aware of is that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm part of a very small minority, so I have a very European uh, way of living. Um, so, of course, this is not the kind of European identity that can be promoted as an example, right? Because uh, it's it's again uh, limited to a very few people. But even without the chance I had to to travel and to to study elsewhere, I certainly had a European. Um, a certain, to some extent, a European education through uh, the French European system, trying to be open uh, to to a Euro what, what what is described uh, in the French curriculum as as a European culture. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, you mentioned about that uh, uh, the minority, right? And and that uh, drew to my mind another question: To what extent? the notions of identity, of heritage, of European identity and European heritage are still meaningful for the people in general, in general in Europe? Well, this is this is very hard to, to say. Uh, there are a lot, actually, the European institutions are very interested in this. They make mm -hmm. a lot of opinion polls, as you know, the Eurobarometers, there is an entire an entire institution dedicated to those uh, opinion polls. And it's interesting to see that a lot of questions are actually dedicated to see, are you, uh, well, some questions are, do you feel European? Um, what identity comes first for you, your national? So the, the, the European institutions look at this. And um, 
and they also ask about the awareness of people to European uh, to European heritage. And I think again, it's the different. It's very different according again to the social background, to the edu educational background of people. Um, but I would say I don't. I'm not a specialist of public opinion. Some scholars look at this, but it's 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 relatively weak. Uh, even though we live in a global uh, society, uh, people are exposed to internet, etc. But it does not does not mean that it really enlarged the the cultural horizon of the individuals. Um, mm -hmm. It seems that the cultural references um, of of a big majority of people are still uh, mostly national, regional. Or global, but then it's a global pop culture that is not necessarily European. So um, I'm not I'm not sure that it's uh, uh, that meaningful uh, at the individual level, mm -hmm. uh, uh, right. according to the to the the social groups you and and the the national groups you look at. Mm -hmm. Right, and the European Union's future is at stake. That's for sure. Yes, but again, um, this is a big question. Do we need, you know, it's a, one huge question of the chicken and egg. Do we need a European identity yeah. to have a European political, a functioning European pro political project? Do we need a European demos to have a European political project or a functioning, uh, fair uh, European project and European political institutions will bring about uh, uh, a European identity, and this is why I end. I, I finished with um, the example of the COVID crisis. Again, it's too early to see the long-term um, um, effects of this. But here, the EU um, apparently, from what we could see of late, the latest opinion polls, etc., was gained in legitimacy and definitely gained in political uh, momentum through this crisis, but through, again, very concrete material um, actions uh, and not so much by, as I said, promoting uh, a European uh, common identity, but maybe by making in practice uh, a European solidarity emerge. Thank you very much. I'd like to refer to, to the problem of values. Well, many experts uh, rightfully claim that European Union is a normative power uh, and very specific axiological space, right? Uh, we all know that uh, Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union indicates that the Union is, is founded on, the, uh, on certain values. Uh, and European values has been uh, put on the highest level um, on the uh, hierarchy of legal norms, right? Giving them a, a, a primacy over other norms and, and rules within the European uh, legal system, uh, European legal space. We all know that. But it uh, cannot be questioned that some states like, like Hungary, like, like Poland, uh, nowadays treat these European values uh, instrumentally. I mean, openly in instrumental way as a means to certain political ends, uh, ends that differs that differ from from goals indicated by by the values. So in this context, Orian, um, I would like to ask you, how would you assess uh, the possibility of securing European values and therefore some kind of uh, European Union's political uh, identity uh, or political heritage. Well, uh, this is this is a, a huge a huge challenge. I'm afraid I will not have a a, a a good answer to this. We will have to see first. I mean, you know, there is a system. Normally, there is a legal system which is actually uh, at work now uh, for this type of uh, breaching of the fundamental value. Uh, with this Article Seven, so uh, and I'm not I'm not a lawyer, so I, I will not uh, go into details here. This is an ongoing uh, this is an ongoing process, but as you know, it's already criticized because 
Uh, the main tension here is that here the European Union has to take sanctions against member states of the European Union. And as we know, the European Union is also an intergovernmental uh, um, entity uh, where member states can, through alliances, through veto, through they can block uh, certain processes. So here um, we will have to see how far the sanction uh, uh, um, process can go, but it is it is apparently very limited. Um, so uh, will will uh, again? It's a bit it's a bit too early. But as you know, uh, Viktor Orban was uh, was re-elected uh, 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 very recently with a, so with a great uh, popularity in his in his country. So. You know, he, he will always be able to claim his political legitimacy against the political legitimacy of, of the European Union, which is really easy to portray as, as a, a sort of a, a supranational uh, dictatorship trying to, you know, in this kind of uh, rhetoric. So how to secure those values? Obviously, I would say to, to find a way to more efficiently sanction those breaching those values. Um, but uh, the, the, the very complex and multi-layered uh, uh, nature of the EU make this, uh, this make, uh, system uh, quite, quite complicated to establish. Um, so I, I really don't have the, the miracle solution here. Uh, Orian, if you could uh, take a look on um, uh, on our chat, uh, there is uh, the question from our colleague, uh, Professor Kinga Gaida. Mm -hmm. uh, how important does the professor think uh, it is for heritage and identity to be supported by European initiatives, such as the European Heritage Label? Yes, thank you uh, for, for the question. Um, actually, I, I worked on this on this program. It's one of, of the programs that I looked at to understand this conception of, of heritage. Um, well, the European Heritage um, Label is an example, um, as far as I, I can see it, of a of a rather um, top down definition of of heritage. Um, in the sense, and again, a quite at least at is its inception. I don't know how it evolved uh, in in the in the latest years, but it was this idea of selecting certain mostly charismatic uh, sites, both actually uh, material but also immaterial uh, sites, like the actually the Polish Constitution is one uh, has the this European Heritage label. Um, so to select those sites uh, and to attribute them uh, this European label, so to show that their to show their significance for a common European identity. But what I felt when I I I, I, I saw when when this this label was created, it was more again an instrumentalization of of heritage, uh, useful for the EU in the sense that. Uh, the EU was using um, very uh, already charismatic uh, sites and and uh, symbols, um, you know, to to um, and to represent them as European as a way again of illustrating a common European identity. I can give you another another example. The sorry for my pr pronunciation. The Gdansk uh, shipyards in Poland. Are receive this European Heritage label as, of course, uh, the birthplace of uh, Solidarnosc and uh, the, the resistance to communism in Poland, etc. Uh, but you see, these places are obviously of great importance already, um, and it's a way to say, well, it's also European, right? So, uh, of course, it's positive. I, I perfectly recognize that it's uh, it's also. So, uh, a European, uh, it's obviously a European site, but I think it's 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 useful for the European institutions to have this uh, European label again to offer visibility to uh, a, a common European identity, and um, I, maybe there is an interest for the, the those sites 
to get this label, but you know, it doesn't really come with any fund or it's really more symbolic. So um, I don't think, I'm not sure that it will make a huge difference for these sites, but it can maybe make a difference for against the, the image of the EU. This is how I, I see this. Thank you very much, uh, Orian. And uh, maybe the last question. Uh, do you think we need some kind of, well, I called it uh, European internationalism? Well, I mean some kind of, you know, political ideology that promotes uh, both European integration, um, strict cooperation within the EU, uh, full political engagement uh, uh, for this pur purpose, but also a, a consequent enhancement of uh, European uh, community on, on the basis of, of, of values, of uh, laws, as well as some kind of, you know, European mindset. And, you know, preferred modes of, of functioning. Uh, you see, what I'm talking about here is, is uh, uh, some possible political ideology uh, or political uh, ideological answer to what is going on right now uh, in the uh, European Union, because as I said, probably uh, European Union's uh, future is at stake or might be at stake. So do we need something like this, like U European internationalism? Well, I mean, it's um, again, it's you, you speak of ideology. Um, again, I take the, the, the standpoint of the European institution, because as you know, my research is to understand how institutions produce symbols, discourse mm -hmm. on common identities. And I would say, I mean, s such an ideology, if it, um, if it had a, a bottom-up uh, emergence, yes, would, be, would certainly, and if it could flourish uh, in a bottom-up bottom way, uh, yes, it could certainly help the, the European Union a lot, uh, especially in those conflicts that we were describing before with uh, Eurosceptic uh, um, uh, governments within the EU. Uh, the problem is that uh, what I would think of is if this has to be promoted again at the institutional level from a top down in, in a top down manner. And here, of course, this, this is more uh, problematic. You know, when I'm talking about promoting an ideology um, top down, and then this there will be this creates resistance. Right. So um, yes, inter 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 international inter internationalization inter. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now after almost an hour and a half, I'm very tired. Internationalism. Um, uh, yes, it's it could be a positive. Uh, um, it would it would certainly help the EU, but it depends from where it comes from. This is this is the the main yeah. the main issue. I think. Sure. Uh, Orian, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our uh, meeting is uh, coming to an end, but we are staying with, uh, you know, great perspectives, research uh, perspectives um, uh, and perspectives for uh, further discussions about European Union. Uh, thanks to Orian Caligaro, we have a lot uh, to think about. Orian, thank you very much once again. Uh, we wish you all the best and maybe see you in Krakow. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sometime. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Ladies and gents, uh, our project is ending on Tuesday, uh, May 21st. Uh, stay with us. Uh, we will be hosting uh, Professor John Ishiyama, President of, of the European, uh, sorry, American um, Political Science Association. Thank you for today. Stay with us. Orian, thank you very much once again and see you another time. Thank you very much.